Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? It's going great, Michael. How are you doing? All good, thank you. We just got off the call with Max Booth. As anyone who's familiar with Max and his work may expect, it's a pretty hilarious conversation. A lot of humour, a lot of funny anecdotes, but perhaps more importantly, some great writing advice as well. I think our listeners are going to really enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. Max has got like a completely different approach. It works. It might not work for everybody, but it's something that you should at least consider. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like really kind of blunt and practical. And that's, that's one of the things I really like about Max. Yeah. And his latest novel, The Nightly Disease, which is kind of a fictionalized account of him working in the hotel, is laugh out loud hilarious. It really is. Yeah, definitely. It, it's it's very funny. It's very dark, and it, it, it's it's rare that you find somebody who can pull the funny and the dark at the same time. And but he man, he nails it in this one. And someone who can keep the humor coming, keep the laughs coming for like the duration of a novel, and it, yeah, it's not an especially short novel either. No, I think it's getting on for ninety thousand words. Yeah, it's it's good. If if you haven't read it, y'all need to get on it. Okay, well, before we have the conversation with Max, here is a quick word from our sponsors. The Tennis Podcast is a docudrama about an ancient and mysterious myth, perhaps the last genuine mystery of the information age. It is a cross between Serial, Lost, and an Andre Tarkovsky film. Tennis is what happens when the lines of science and fiction start to blur. So download the podcast The Guardian Calls, compelling and wildly addictive at iTunes.com slash Tannis or TannisPodcast.com. Tannis, it's television for your ears. You will never forget I Can Taste the Blood, a new collection of dark fiction from Bram Stoker nominees Josh Mallerman, John F.D. Taff, and more. Open the doors to a theater of the damned. Walk 500 miles in the footsteps of sin. Commit a crime spree that never ends. Witness life and death through the eyes of a tortured soul, and learn the truth about what's killing small town America. I Can Taste the Blood is now available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymetalpress.com. Okay, so we're back, and I believe, Bob, that you have Max's bio. Yes, I do. Max Booth the third is the author of four novels. His mom has read at least one of them. His novels include the newly released Nightly Disease, Toxicity, I guess that's how you say that, and How to Successfully Kidnap Strangers. He is the editor-in-chief of Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing and an ongoing columnist at LitReactor.com. He works as a hotel night auditor in a small town outside San Antonio, Texas. You can follow him on Twitter at GiveMeYourTeeth and visit him at talesfromthebooth.com. Okay, well, without further ado, let's do it. Let's jump into the conversation with Max Booth the Third on the This Is Horror podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. Max Booth, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. How's it going? It's going all right. Thank you. How's it going with you two? Not too bad. As Bob would say, I'm all coffeeed up. That's right. I am all coffeeed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Max, last year you released The Nightly Disease. What can you tell us about that novel? It takes place in a hotel at night. It's mostly based off of my own experiences from walking the night shift at a hotel. It's kind of a strange book. I would say if David Lynch had directed Kevin Smith's Clocks, maybe it would be close. That's the best way I can describe it. It's kind of nihilistic. It's, I hope it's funny. I mean, you've read it, right? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, yes, I have. I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I think it's funny. I mean, I thought it was laugh out loud, hilarious, and a very fast-paced novel as well. And there's owls. I mean, you haven't mentioned owls yet. I think that's an integral part. Is it? Yes, it is. 
Well, in the opening in the opening of the book, the night guy, his name is Isaac. He walks into his shift and he sees a new front desk lady who's doing the three to eleven. She just began the shift. And as soon as she sees Isaac, she looks at him and goes, excuse me, but do you know, well, I could pet an owl in this town. Mm. And Isaac just looks at him and goes, what? And that is that conversation. It's something that happened to me. And as the nights progressed, once she asked me that question, I just kind of became obsessed with them. I began seeing them any place I went somehow it became this strange paranoid obsession. So I had to go into the book and it ended up being a central plot to the book somehow. So that links into a question that we had from Adrian so- Shotbolt via Patreon, who was asking, where does the L thing come from? But you're saying that it was actually this girl in the hotel that started yeah. your obsession and your interest in owls. Yeah, and I don't know how she would react if she read that book. I think she might get a restraining order against me because it gets kind of creepy. I mean, she ends up getting a face eaten by one of them. (laughs) She's long gone from my hotel now, but I mean, if she read the book, I don't know exactly how she would react. And also, Adrian, I don't know why he's asking that question because he better read that book for me. He knows already. But he... I mean, I think he's asking about your obsession generally. So, I mean, he knows where it comes from in the story, but... Oh, he knows. He knows. Adrian, you (laughs) knew. What are you doing, Adrian? (laughs) Come on. You you know, Adrian. (laughs) This is going to be a great podcast if uh, (laughs) for every Patreon question, the answer is, you know. You know the answer to that. (laughs) (laughs) I can we'll see what you, happens. I can tell you where you can pet an owl in Japan because as well as having cat cafes, we have owl cafes. So you That's can, amazing. You can go to an owl cafe. You can get a cup of coffee and you can see a load of owls. So I'm going to have to do that. I will Wait, are they, that. are they just flying free around the establishment? Are they caged? What What's the deal? What's going on? I believe that there are a number of them that are flying free. That's chaos. I know. I know. I'm <laughs> I'm going I'm going to go. Someone invi- asked me about going to one the other day. Yeah. Why why am I doing this interview? Why aren't I at an L cafe right now? I mean, we we could stop right now. Yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, that's, that's bring, it. <laughs> bring bring the podcast pa- podcasting equipment and we can do the show at the pub at the cafe. Yeah, that would be amazing. Do yeah. they have do they have L cafes in America? I'm assuming it's a ja- Japanese thing. I mean, they don't have. I doubt it. Then. No, <laughs> no, not in Texas. We're, we're lucky to see an owl. I mean, that's uh, you can you you usually can hear them, but I mean they're they're it's kind of hard to see one. It's a pred- they're a predatory animal. Mm. So uh, when you do okay. see one. It's they usually are like, wow, that's a that's an owl, <laughs> you know. So I mean, it's you know it. I mean, it, you're not going to mistake it for anything else. Wow. Okay, so to go back to the co local who asked me if she if I knew a place she could pet one, she continued to tell me that every night when she would go to sleep, she could hear the hooting on top of the roof, and she knew that it would only come when she was sad. She was convinced that it would come to comfortable with hoots whenever she was feeling sad. And she wanted to pet it, but any time she would go outside, it would fly away. So I suggested maybe she should get some mice and just let them roam around the bedroom at yeah. night. And it would come in through the window. And she was like, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know if she tried it, but I'm convinced she did. So actually quite a lot. Of what goes into the nightly disease in terms of that conversation actually happened. That conversation, yes. Some of the things that happened in the book, maybe they <laughs> happened. I can't say unless someone is listening. I'm looking at you, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's my GM. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, this girl who asked you about the owl, did she work at the hotel for a long time? And, I mean, was the owl thing a kind of one-day deal? Or, you know, every time you're on a shift, would you get a little little fact about an owl? Or did you just, like, bring it into a conversation? She lasted a few months, but it was only that one night she talked about him. And every time I would seal again, I would bring it up and she would just laugh it off and walk away. So maybe she was ashamed? <laughs> I don't know. Is it possible that you hallucinated the conversation and she's like laughing because yeah. it's like, Max, <laughs> you are crazy. I never once mentioned an owl. So you've it's created possible- your own obsession. <laughs> And then um, on Christmas, we will secret Santas, and I gave a little stuffed one as a gift, and she looked at it, and she was like, why did you give this to me? <laughs> I was like, don't you remember the conversation we had? She just laughed and walked away. Well, this is it, Max. I mean, every time you bring it up, she doesn't say that she remembered it. She just laughs awkwardly. What could this mean? <laughs> what else have I hallucinated? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> hey, a few minutes ago, were you talking about a cafe that you could go to and pet one? That's true. Yeah. Did that happen? I didn't hallucinate that. No, no, that really happened. <laughs> okay. I need I need a ba- I need to backtrack everything I know and just Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Conform it's this reality. It, it's called L Cafe and Bar L Village. It's in Shibuya for anyone in Tokyo. Now, is that a real place? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the place with a famous crossing, Shibuya Crossing. I'm, not, I'm unconvinced you're telling me the truth right now because that's, <laughs> that, that sounds like a fake place. <laughs> well, Google it, <laughs> Shibuya. I'm not googling that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like you're afraid that you might get the FBI. <laughs> I fell victim to googling one time with a blue waffle. I'm not going to oh, do it again. Dear God, <laughs> oh, dear Oh Lord. <laughs> yeah. If anyone doesn't know what that is at home, please Google blue oh. waffle. <laughs> please support mm-hmm. the podcast. <laughs> please don't turn up. I've seen that going around on Facebook. I had no clue. I had no clue. So, you know, I did the old copy and paste, you know, where you highlight and click search Google. You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. This podcast was not meant to ever cover Blue Evan? Waffle. Hey, I mean, we, we reached 130 or so episodes without it happening. That wasn't a bad run. <laughs> it's all gone downhill now. I thought maybe it was always in the show notes, but you never had enough time to get to it. And now this time, you finally had your chance. No, no, that's <laughs> Goatsy who's always in the show notes, but unfortunately, <laughs> Blue Waffle has not made it made it there until now, perhaps. Well, we should celebrate. Congratulations, <laughs> fellas. We should. Oh, my God. So... We're going to move away from the hotel, although we'll invariably move back, I'm sure. Okay, sounds good. I wondered what your best writing advice was. Although you know that I didn't wonder that because I asked you via Facebook. But it was such a good answer, let's pretend that I'm asking you for the very first time. Okay. Well, Michael, that's a good question. Um, Oh, thank you. I've never been asked before. How did you think of that? I, I, I don't know, just happened like okay. an, an owl well, flew in with the question and that is not funny that that is not funny no, don't I'm joke about very that. very sorry okay i apologize <laughs> 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 my best writing advice would be to not act like writing is a special thing you only you can do to treat writing like a like any job like you're flipping um, hand boggles at McDonald's or picking up trash outside of a house. It's just a job. And if you treat it like a job, you're more likely to get the shit done. Yeah. No, I think that's actually really good advice because you can, uh, it allows you to be repetitive. And that's something that you're going to have to, you know, 
work into writing and that's not, it's something I'm working on. I need to try to, you know, I'm trying to write every single day. So you almost have to treat it like you're clocking in, clocking out. It's how you do time management. So I think that's, that's actually pretty worthwhile advice. Well, thank you. Max, did it take you a while to get comfortable with your writing and to just be able to approach it in that way? Or is it always something that's come fairly naturally to you and you haven't really had a problem just churning out the words and not kind of getting too crippled by the likes of self-doubt and other obstacles? Well, I wouldn't say I'm comfortable with writing. I don't think I'm ever going to be. But I'm also not too comfortable with my hotel job either. I, I don't really know what I'm doing most of the time, but I fake it long enough, and it seems like I know what I'm doing, and no one raises any questions. So, I mean, when I, when I began writing, I would say I, I took it kind of like, oh, look at me, I'm writing a book the fuck are you doing with your life but now it's like okay i gotta write this book by this date or else i'll lose my job i mean i'm not gonna lose my job but it helps to to use that mentality that i have to get this done or i'm not gonna get my paycheck and then i can't buy fountain drinks at the gas station or whatever it is i need i can't subscribe to netflix and i mean as well as your fiction writing you have a number of non-fiction gigs on the go for Gamut magazine, for Lit Reactor, amongst others. So, I mean, do you kind of have a set quota in terms of how much you have to produce each month to, well, really to be able to pay the bills? And I, I should, but I'm not that well organized. Basically, I pitch as much as I can to all the places I write nonfiction with. And if they accept them all, then I guess I'm going to write them all. <laughs> Maybe a bit late, but I'm going to get it done. Yeah, I remember you were saying that you had a lot of things on just this week alone. Yeah, well, this month I'm doing five columns. No, six columns and a book review. And then next month, I'm probably going to be doing five columns and two book reviews. And that's just the nonfiction aspect of what I do each month. Doesn't I'm also doing a short story once a week now, thanks to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't include anything I do with Perpetual Motion Machine, my small press. I'm constantly editing, promoting the books I publish. Yeah, you've certainly got your work cut out for you. And how are you finding the short story writing challenge at the moment? I mean, we're only a couple of weeks into it. Um, it's going okay, I guess. I knocked out week one pretty okay, and I just begun week two's entry, which I hope to get done sometime before Sunday. I don't know what happens if I don't get it done, if... I owe someone money. Do I owe you money? I might. I, didn't, I, I did not read the contract I signed. I mean, it does kind of involve Bob Pastorella turning up at your house. And, yeah, it's kind of Bob's discretion as to where he takes it from there. Oh, well, that's okay. We can go get some water bogle. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I show up at his house, we're going to the San Antonio Book Fest. So. That's not... <laughs> That's not much of a punishment. Or maybe it is. We haven't <laughs> been to the San Antonio Book Fest. It is. It is when I make that, when I make Max buy my French vanilla creamer. You oh, betcha. That was a that was a pain in the ass. <laughs> so we've got a number of questions from our Patreon. First one is from George, and he would like to know. What would you say to someone who is considering starting up a small press or magazine? Okay, I have many questions. Do I know this person who's asking me, or is it just a random guy approaching me on the street? Let's let's assume that you know them. Okay, do I like them? <sighs> you <laughs> you <laughs> see, like. <laughs> Hartley, you're asking too many questions because I want to give, like, kind of stupid answers now like well you give the pretense that you like them but deep down you don't know no fuck it let's let's keep it useful for the listeners as as we are want to do and say yes you like them 
Like, not romantically, like, you're not looking to sleep with them. It's just like a, a friendship. Oh, my. Okay, that that does help. I, I, I'm here to be helpful. <laughs> I would look at them. I would look them straight in the eye. Only one eye, because I do have a, I am, I do have a lazy eye, so I can only look one eye at a time. I would look them in the eye. I would grab the hand kind of softly. That's nice. And I would, and I would say, <laughs> why? Why would you do that? And then my next statement would be based off of what they tell me. I would most likely ask how much, how much money they have in their bank accounts. And if it's less than what I have, I would say, don't do it <laughs> because I don't have anything. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is don't do it. Just don't do something else. Do anything else. You don't want to do it. Okay. What about someone who's definitely going to start up a small press or magazine and you can't change their mind and they're looking for some <laughs> helpful tips so that they might actually be able to launch it successfully. <laughs> I would ask them why they're asking me because I am the opposite of successful. And then I would suggest <laughs> limiting how many publications they release once a year. I wouldn't increase. I wouldn't go past three to begin with. Maybe just stick with one and save up as much money as you can because this shit is more expensive than you think it is. And be ready to just completely disappoint everybody you know, everybody you love. Be ready to disappoint yourself, most of all. But if you're selling a small press, you're, you're quite used to disappointing yourself. I mean, let's be honest. Okay, so how many publications are uh, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing putting out in 2017? In 2017, I am releasing eight books. Okay. Which is way too many. And what kind of budget do you set aside for each title? And of course, I'm guessing that it varies as to whether it's an anthology, a novella, the type of book that it is. Okay. Again, I mean, I'm a successful small press. <laughs> but the budget we set aside is pff, a few hundred to a thousand on each book, which is not enough at all to really launch a book. I would say if you wanted to be completely successful, 10,000 on each book, but who's going to do that? I Not in the small press universe. Mm. And what are some of the things that you outsource and what do you do in-house? Well, we don't. We usually don't make the the jackets, the cover designs. We don't distribute the books. We don't print the books. We go through print on demand services like Lightning Source. Mm. But we in house. I do all of the editing. My wife does the interior formatting, and we do basically all the promotion. See if we have a. If we had more money, we would find someone who is actually skilled in promoting books and we might be more successful. What are the types of things that you do do to promote the book? I mean, all types of things. We we get this big wagon, okay? It's a red wagon. We put the books in them and we just walk down the street and we knock on the houses and we go, do you want to read a book? And if they say, yeah, <laughs> we go, what kind of book do you want to read? And usually they say, oh, I don't know. I kind of like Twilight. And then we just walk away. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they say, oh, I like crime fiction. And I go, oh, no shit. Well, we have crime fiction. And they go, do you have any James Paddleson? And we turn around and we walk away. And we don't sell a damn thing. Uh, well, th thank you for that. I'm sure that will be very useful for <laughs> anyone looking to... It is, um... <laughs> It's known as the red wagon approach. Okay. Look so it up. <laughs> we'll write that in the show notes. The so red wagon approach. Okay. Thank you, Max. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. What's the, what's the um, Nets Patreon question? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we've got some of these that are just going to lend themselves to a fucking <laughs> stupid answer. Let me see what my have I not. given one have I given one stupid answer this whole interview? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've liked all your answers so far. I've liked the answers. Thank, thank you, Bob. I, I have liked the answers. It doesn't mean I, I like I like every answer he's given. 
I don't know if they're good answers or not, but <laughs> I, 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 would, like I would say so. I would say they're helpful. Yeah. Wait, listen, if someone came to my house and not, and they had a red wagon of books, I would buy them all. Would you not? I don't know if yeah, I could, probably. I don't know if I, I would, could fit I would, a red wagon's worth of books in my apartment. Well, I'm not asking you, Michael, because you don't read physical books. We all know that. <laughs> I'm asking Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd buy them, but I don't know. I, did, I have a I have a problem with anybody knocking on my door asking me for money anyway. So I don't know. The, la- the last person that did that, I was about to subscribe to like five magazines because it was really going to help him out. And I mean, no, I, I am not kidding either. This is probably about two years ago. I was going to get my checkbook, and just something told me not to do this. I just went back to the door and said, "I'm not going to do it," and I shut the door on him. <laughs> <laughs> He died that was, day too. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> and the guy, I mean, he was like, he goes, "Oh, it's cool," and he walks off, you know. And I'm just he like, died. No, I don't think they were scam artists. <laughs> he needed that money to live that day. <laughs> he didn't give it to him. He died. <laughs> you killed someone, Bob. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Wasn't my fault. I mean, Bob, Bob, what were these magazines about? I can't believe that you nearly subscribed to five, five magazines. <laughs> some well, the, guy, the, guy, the guy was a good salesperson. He was what? just giving Obviously. a good, good spiel. I mean, you know, one of them was like, you know, Sports Illustrated. And then, uh, you know, I think one of them was National Geographic. I mean, they were legit magazines. I just felt, I don't know, I felt icky about the whole thing. You know, and I was just like, oh, you know, no, I don't want to do it this. Was, it was one of those magazines. No, it wasn't any of those. Oh, okay. Why would I buy that when I can get that for free? Well, I was going to say you would have had absolutely no doubts or reservations if it was those. You would have kept writing those checks. You would have been like, how much? Take it all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, hold on. Wait, wait a second. Hold on. Penthouse. Just... Penthouse and Hustler? Both? Really? Okay. <laughs> whoa, whoa, Bob, Bob! I was talking about new scientists or something. Oh. Whoa, whoa! <laughs> oh, those magazines! <laughs> whoa! Well, switching gears now. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> that wasn't a question. <laughs> but now, now there w- there's there's about to be a question. <laughs> This question is from David Powell via Patreon, and he's talking about word count and page count. So he said, you you said on Facebook that you think 86,000 words may be too long for a small press book. That would only be 191 pages, correct? That's not the whole no. question, by the way. That's not, when, that's when, not correct no, at all. Okay, so no to that part of the question. When it comes to a novel, 300-ish pages seems to be my sweet spot at 150,000 words. Can you elaborate on word count? I think about it constantly in regards to beat sheets and such. The good thing to keep in mind is when you write like in a doc on a laptop... The page count is not what is going to be when you print the book. Like my hotel book was uh, like eighty six thousand, but mm. printed is three hundred and eighty pages long. You have to keep in mind that everything that fits in a, in a little doc is it's not going to be the same. It's going to shrink down in a physical book. And yeah, eighty six thousand is about the maximum most small presses really want to do just because the longer the book is the more it's going to cost to print it and the more expensive they have to make the listing cost so that's what my comment meant Mm. on the one that he is talking about and speaking of listing costs i mean what do you think is the upper limit that a small press can reasonably charge for a paperback book a novel um well um, my publisher has the hotel book at $16.99. That might be too much. I don't know if I can say that, but I would say like 15 bucks at the most. 
it's difficult. No one wants to spend like twenty bucks on a book unless like you're crazy like me. I I'll spend anything on a book. I have no self control. Mm. But it's difficult to to push a book that's like twenty bucks. So I would say maximum fifteen. What do you think? I think similarly. I mean, first of all, if if I want the book, that is the priority, and I guess at the point. Up to about 15 to 20 pounds, I won't ask too many questions, but if it is over 20 pounds, then at that point, I think I have to think, okay, do I really want the book? How much do I want it? Because obviously I don't have an unlimited yeah. amount of money, so there is there does come to be a point where you have to really think about it. Yeah, I mean, if at that point I'm looking at the ebook ebook cost, like how much is the ebook? I'm... Mm. Even an ebook, I'll probably spend up to about fifteen pounds on it. Oh my! I, the max my, my maximum with ebooks is like six bucks because at that point it's like, why don't I just buy the paperback then? Yeah. See, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. If the if the ebook, there's very few ebooks I'll buy that are over seven dollars. Because I can get the mass market paperback used for less. Sorry, but I, you know, I have a budget. So if anybody's listening, it's like you bought my book used. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, because I I know what I can spend on books. The most I've ever spent on a book was seventy five dollars. What book was that? That was damn. What book was that? I you think don't that know. Was, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I think it's the. Uh, one of my Geiger books. One of my Geiger, my HR Geiger books. Okay. So that was expensive. But yeah. the previous listing was $250. So I got a deal. You made, you, you made <laughs> out. Yeah, I did good. <laughs> but as you both know, if it's a case of the ebook or the physical book, I'll often buy the ebook just for the. What? You, you, you know this. <laughs> just for the sake of convenience for storage for minimalism the only time that i'll buy the physical book is okay if there's not an ebook then at that point i don't have another option then i'll buy the physical book or i guess if it's a a reference book some sort of non-fiction book that i want to be able to easily you know kind of dip in and out of or if there's particularly good artwork so i mean wonder book by jeff vandermeer i bought the physical oh you have to of that one yeah edition of that because the artwork and just the whole way it's presented you know part of the experience is getting that physical book i think now that we're hoping to be settled in japan because you've got to remember before i was moving between the uk japan portugal so every year or so being somewhere else but now that we're settled i think i might quite enjoy collecting physical books again so could be a return (laughs) should we clap i don't know (laughs) yeah that's about the kind of clap it deserves (laughs) I'm get, gonna move to your your favorite question now, Max, which is uh Thomas Joyce would like to know what led you to take on Dark Moon Digest and then part two, which I know is your favorite, and in general, why be an editor? I'm gonna I'm gonna skip question one at the moment and just go straight to question two and ask what what does he mean by that? <laughs> does he mean does he mean me? Like why do I have the balls to do that? Like, has he read what I've written? And he thought, <laughs> well, that guy, that guy should not edit anything. <laughs> well, does he, well, does he mean like, why should anyone, why would anyone take on that kind of gig? To reframe the question, why did you decide to get into editing after writing? I mean, why not just concentrate on writing? Well, I thought maybe it would help me improve my own writing. That's what began my interest in mm. editing. I, I, I just I wanted to improve as best as I could, and it seemed like a good way to focus on the craft of it all and just improve my own stuff, and also somehow improve what 
Edel people were writing at the same time. I know. I I sense that there's a second part because you said you thought it would. Is that not <laughs> how it panned out? <laughs> no, it 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 did. I just phrased it like an idiot. But yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> okay. I thought, I thought it, it it did help me tremendous tremendously. And I think anyone at least should take a few months this slushing reading slash for magazine because it, it does help because you get you read so much bad shit man like so much and it really opens your mind of what is bad writing and what is good writing mm. and i mean what do you think from your own experience then what are some of the telltale signs of a good story and equally a bad story something that grabs my attention is obviously going to be something that I'm going to keep reading. I mean, look what decade this is. It's, I mean, it's already 17, 27, blah, 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 blah. it's already 2017. We have so much content at all disposal at any given moment. And mm. everything is just a thumb flick away. You have to give the audience a reason to continue from as soon as you begin even the title it has to be something it has to be something that's gonna make me give a shit about it if it's some goddamn thing i've seen a thousand times like beneath the moon or underneath the steel case or inside the darkness (laughs) i'm not gonna i'm not i'm just gonna delete it without reading because it's gonna be bad because i just i already know from the title I don't know if that's an intelligent way to edit anything, but you read enough slush, you can begin knowing from the title, from just like the full sentence, if it's going to be real too wild. A good telltale sign of a bad story would be if you begin reading and you can already predict the ending by the end of page one, which is something that happens quite a bit. So it sounds like sometimes when you're reading slush that if they've got a bad story title, that could be enough for you to stop reading. Yeah, I mean, I should I admit that? Maybe not. I don't know. I'm going to. But yeah, if it's a title that I just look at it and think, this is not going to be good. I might open it and just kind of scan it and be like, yep, I was right. Hmm. Reject. So you don't like, you don't like generic titles? That like would be correct. Reading. That's good to know because I'm changing... A title on something I'm working on now. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it was generic or anything like that. But yeah. I mean, I think of it this way: if you spend so much time writing something, don't you want to give it a, the title it deserves, not something that's just like I don't know, man, just like vanilla ice cream that's melted in the sun? It's like I, I don't want that. You have to make it look nice from the get-go. The right. title is what makes someone have initial interest. And then they read from the title. They go from page one. If they think, okay, this is still interesting, I'm going to go to page two. You have to always keep in mind that the audience could just d- close out at any given moment and read something else. Well, not read anything else. They might go to youtube and watch a video of cute kittens i don't know have you ever read a story that you felt like it was telegraphing the ending and yet you continued on and realized that they weren't telegraphing the ending in the story yeah a few times i mean i've i've all i usually do read all of it if i do think it's going to be predictable i'll just kind of skim read it and it has happened i was surprised so I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying do not lead expe- expectations and then throw something completely different in front of the audience. That's yeah, definitely do that. Just write it well, write it so I give a shit about it. Going on from that and talking about the type of stories that you read, we've got a question from Johan Thorson who asks, "Do you agree?" with Stephen King when he says that writers should read everything, classics to trash, if they want to become a good writer? Or are you more in the Dan Simmons camp, who claims that to become a good writer, you should read only the very best literature available? 
I would definitely be in the Stephen King camp because, like I was saying, the best way to improve yourself as a as as a writer is to read just absolute shit in a, in a slush. And if you don't have a way to read slush, just find trash and read it all. So you can, if you can, if you can point out why a book is not successful, then you can use those notes to avoid when you write something yourself. And what do you think once you get to a certain level as a writer? I mean, like obviously now with a number of publishing credits behind you, running your own small publishers, do you still purposefully seek out you know stories that aren't that good just to remind yourself what isn't good as well as what is or do you try and concentrate more on the good stuff now well i a i would not claim to be at that level yet i don't think i would be i'm ever going to be at that type of level and b i still do because i read slash pretty much every day and a lot of it is not the greatest mm. But I do not seek out already published books just because I think it's going to be bad. At this point, I just don't have time to do that. I'm already reading enough bad fiction through slush piles or sometimes books I review. I um, review books I lit react on sometimes. I do not like those books. Mm. To go back to the first question that Thomas Joyce asked that, you you said you weren't going to answer at that point. Perhaps now is a good time. So what what led you to take on Dark Moon Digest? Okay, yeah. It be when I began bracing the writing scene because it is a big it's a big scene once you get into it. When I was I was maybe seventeen, maybe even sixteen. I don't know now, but I um that was about the time I realized that I needed to. The only way to improve my writing would be to try to read slash and try to analyze what things I like and what things I don't and why that is. And at the same time, this magazine I was subscribed to, they put out an open call for um, Valentil Associate Editors, which is a fancy way of saying slash readers. So I sent them an email and they... The man who owned it at the time, Stan Swanson, he, he took me on. He also took on my now wife, Lori Michelle, as an associate reader as well. And for a few years, we did nothing but just help Stan Swanson with the magazine. And eventually, he just he got sick of the whole scene, and he just didn't want to publish anymore. So he asked us if we wanted to take it over, and we said, yeah. And we love that magazine. It seemed like a no-shit answer. Why wouldn't we take it on? And that's what happened, Thomas. Yeah, and what are your plans for Dark Moon Digest going forward? Just to continue publishing the best fiction we can find. And we also recently launched a Patreon as a way to subscribe to the magazine at just, at just one buck a month. So there's a nice little plug, a Patreon plug. We have no plans of doing anything different. We're still releasing fiction, reviews, columns every three months. And for those who are interested in becoming a patron, what are some of the benefits? Some of the benefits? They get to fill up the best magazine around. I mean, I'm not biased when I say that. Let's look at some other magazines. What do they have that we don't? A lot of things. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, at, at at just a buck, you get the magazine every time we release it, which is three times a month. <laughs> no, three months every three months. And at three bucks, you also get the magazine, but you get behind the scenes looks like we announced the TOC of the D of the digest. We, you also get sneak peeks at upcoming PMMP books. 
There's also advertising opportunities, paperback subscriptions. And that's about it. We don't have a ton of different um, perks you can get by pledging. The main thing is just any pledge you make, you automatically get a subscription, an ebook subscription to the magazine. All right. So if you're interested, check it out www.patreon.com forward slash PMM publishing. You pay 12 bucks a year, you get four magazines full of some of the best people writing right now. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's that's a deal. People should get on that. All right. We're going to go with another Patreon question. And, well, this is a first because we've got Adrian Shotbolt asking, does Max have a horror novel in him? So usually when a question is asked... That's it. But then George <laughs> started a, a comment thread and he's like, what? The mind is a razor blade doesn't count. And Adrian oh said, I haven't read it. It's on my Kindle, though. So. <laughs> what do I say about that? I don't know, but it's like. Well, George thing. is the one who published it. Yeah. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> yeah, man. That's that's the answer. <laughs> what about razor blade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's the first question. Do you consider The Mind is a Razor Blade to be a horror novel? Yeah, I do. It's kind of a mix <laughs> a mix of that and science fiction, I would say. Mm. Kind of like um, Dark City. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same type of tone as that movie. But Adrian hasn't read it. Way to be <laughs> a fan. Good job being a fan, Adrian. <laughs> yeah. God damn! <laughs> I I I love I do love that you know George is like well what about the mind is a razor blade and Adrian's like yeah but I haven't read it and if, and if that's that like makes it okay that's like me going you think Stephen King is ever gonna write something about clowns yeah <laughs> what about it oh I haven't read that one. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of a way that we could expand this Patreon question, but really, I mean... I mean, I, I might have one inside of me. I mean, I haven't looked. Yeah, yeah, that's a good okay, way well, to expand well, it. G- g- give me a second. <clears throat> oh my god! It's the shiny, my Stephen King. <laughs> so yeah, I did. Thank you for the heads up, Adrian. There we go. So now let me ask you a question, Max. Did you actually just reach into the uh, the wound inside your stomach via James Woods' video drone and no, pull out I, a book? No, Bob. I uh, reached inside of my anus. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Oh, he he goes he goes deeper. <laughs> And so does the book, but <laughs> so long, long live the new flesh. Huh? Long live the new anus. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. yeah, that's my kind of book. Ooh. I have a feeling that's going to be Max's uh, next book title. Long live the new anus. <laughs> I think um, what's his face is going to copy that before I can get to it. Uh, Chuck Tingle. What the, yeah, him. <laughs> Pounded in the butt by my new anus. <laughs> <laughs> so, what projects are you working on at the moment that you're able to talk about? Mostly, I am editing random PMMP books that will be published later on in 2017. I'm writing a new novel called Cirrhosis. I don't know when it's going to be finished or if and when it's going to be published. Mm. I am in the beginning stages of a of a podcast, but mm. I don't know if I can talk about that podcast at the moment. So I will be silent. You can you can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> acting, like, acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am beginning a podcast with this um, fella named David Wilson Michael, and <laughs> it will be called most likely Lost Signals, and it's kind of like the VHS 
anthology movie silly. It's but instead of visual, that it's going to be all audio submissions. Do you want to talk about it as well, co host <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, we thought that we would release an audio drama, and we were bouncing ideas around, and so we thought a good idea would be to have. Well, in fact, I'm just going to repeat what you fucking said. <laughs> I just realized <laughs> that there's no point in repeating it. I, I guess it is like the audio equivalent of the Twilight Zone, or at least that's what we would like it to be. I thought you were going to say of Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not what we'd like it to be. Yeah, good question, Michael. I'm glad we got to promote <laughs> that. <laughs> but we... Well, not even close to being finished. We have only just begun working on it. So maybe 2018, maybe 2019. Let's see what happens. Yeah. I also recently had a new novella accepted in an upcoming anthology called Golden of Fiends. It's about addiction. So that should be coming out in May. I believe Jack Ketchum has something in it. Jessica McHugh. Um, someone else. I can't think of the name. <laughs> <laughs> Some, someone good I imagine but the anthology is all novellas so I don't imagine too many names will be in the book <laughs> that's about it so this novel Cirrhosis that you're working on what can you tell us about that it began as something not as long I wanted to write about demon cops that was the main thing going into it I wanted to write about demon cops just a phrase demon cops yeah <laughs> and it ended up spiraling into this long novel about kids being abducted and trying to raise uh, like a Lovecraftian creature from under the ground. It's um, it begins based off of something that happened to me when I was a kid. When I was I was maybe nine, ten, walking around with some friends about one a.m. and these cops stopped us and they were just complete dickheads. They would they were calling us all these names and pushing us around. And that's kind of how the book begins. But instead of just being plain old dickhead cops, they turn out to be demons. Well, that's an intriguing start. And how how far through are you? Because you said you weren't sure, you know, who who it's going to be with. So I'm guessing it's you're in the early stages at the moment. Yeah, I'm only about twenty thousand into it. Mm. We shall see what happens. I Maybe. like it already. I like yeah. it already. I have my, I have my credit card ready. So <laughs> you fucking hell, here do you, we go do again. You, <laughs> do you want to do you want to go ahead and tell us the um, credit card number on the? As, on the podcast, uh, I'll, I'll be an exclusive. You. Yeah. I'll PM you. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the fun in that? <laughs> well, it'd be fun for other people, but not for me. Right. <laughs> okay, bye. I didn't buy a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> so you assume someone would steal it and buy a fridge? <laughs> you never know, man. You never know. <laughs> Someone hacked my Amazon account was re re returning movies that I did not want to return. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's what happened because that happened to me too. I, was it a hack? I don't know. Maybe something happened with Amazon, like a glitch. Because I know quite a few people who had random refunds on movies one day. I had random refunds on a book and a movie. I see. And well, that is, that so is a they gave hack. you a gift card. Because of the refunds, which they won't take back. So I'm like, shit, I'm spending it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that's not really something to complain about. That's <laughs> like the opposite. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh no, no they're, re money. they're refunding me. Shit. Well, I mean, I don't know. There's kind of, I always feel like something like that's going to come back on me. Mm. You know, like, you know, a year from now, I'm going to get a letter from Amazon going, well, we. You had some refunds that were fraudulent. We sent you a gift card, which you spent. <laughs> hmm. I mean, that's just, if, if it weren't for bad luck, I have no luck at all. So, there you right. go. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, there's a quote in The Nightly Disease. So, Isaac says, Thank you for calling the goddamn hotel. No, we don't have any fucking rooms. Go kill yourself. Now... I'm not a customer service expert, but 
I assume that this could be a little better in terms of customer service. So I wonder from that. Oh, you, what, you, you think so? Well, I, I have an inkling. I'm not sure though, Max, because I haven't worked in a hotel. So that maybe it's just like because you live in Japan. Yeah. It's different. It's different in the US how we talk to customers. Yeah. But I wonder what is the worst welcome greeting that you've ever given, either over the phone or in person? Okay, yeah, I got one. Last week, I, oh man, this is a long. Okay, I, it's gonna. I need to provide a lot of background to this one. Okay, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm in the process of picking up trash around the lobby, and I get a phone call. A lady says, "What should I do if I need to complain about somebody?" And I said, "Well, you can call me and say, hey, I need to complain about somebody.'" And she said, oh, okay, well, <laughs> my boyfriend's trying to break into my room right now, and I need him to be gone. And she tells me how they had just come down to San Antonio to get away for the weekend. They have a baby that's only a month old. And as soon as they get to the hotel, the boyfriend's like, okay, let's go buy some meth. So the woman, she goes, okay. And she takes him across town to buy meth, and then she leaves him at the house and drives back to the hotel, looks on his cell phone. She finds out he's been cheating on her by looking at his text messages. So she takes his cell phone. She throws it into the swimming pool. She goes up to the room. She begins packing all of his things. He, The guy, he gets back a ride from a friend, I guess. He's knocking and kicking on the room, but she won't open it. That's when she calls me. So I go up to the room. And he's like, I need to get in. She has my stuff. I'm like, okay, well, go down to the lobby. I will go into the room, get the belongings, and bring them down. And the man, he just won't leave. He's like, you can tell he's high on something. He smells like booze so badly. He's like, no, I'm going to watch you. Make sure you get everything I own. I'm like, no, you need to go down to the lobby right now, and I will get it. So he goes, okay, but don't forget my cell phone. He goes into the elevator, and I wait like 10 seconds, and I click the button because I I have a feeling he didn't go down. So it opens up, and sure enough, he's just waiting. Like It was obvious he was waiting for me to open the room so he can run back in. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so I clicked the, so I clicked the lobby button. He went down. I went into the lady's phone, and that's when she told me that he that she threw the cell phone to the swimming pool. I'm like, oh, okay then. <laughs> I get the rest of his belongings. I go down. I tell him. Uh, I didn't say she threw the swimming, the cell phone. I just said, oh, she said she left it outside. <laughs> Right. And he goes, well, I need, I need my cell phone right now. I'm like, okay, well, it's outside, so you can go investigate if you need to. <laughs> but you have to leave the hotel. And he's like, I need you to call the cops right now because she's a lying bitch and she has my phone. I'm like, okay. I, mean, I kind of had to at that point. Because if, I get, if someone's demanding I call the cops, I can't just say no. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, get the police, leave. At that po- at that point, I kind of just called so they could kick him out for me. So the cops were showing up. Before I even called the cops, I told the guy he had to wait outside. So once he left, I locked the entrance. The cops come. The woman comes down into the lobby, and she's she's crying her eyes out, holding this baby. And I'm trying to check in, like guests coming in. It's just and the cops will just surrounding the lobby, and like new guests will come in for the reservations, looking at a crying woman, and all the cops thinking like, what the fuck is going on? And um, so I, I check in a few guests. I'm eavesdropping with the woman and the cop, and the woman's like, yeah, as soon as I got pregnant, this man. He left me to get high on meth, and I didn't see him for eight months. And then all of a sudden, he wants to come back and begin the relationship again. Like, come the fuck on. And then he goes, the cop goes, okay, well, he says you have the cell phone. Do you have it? She goes, I'm going to be honest with you. I threw that piece of shit cell phone in the swimming pool. (laughs) Like, why would you tell the cop that? (laughs) (laughs) Just lie and be like, I don't have it. (laughs) So the cop looks at me, and he goes, "Um, can you go try to fish it out? I'm like, I guess, man. (laughs) So I go outside. I get the fish net. I find the the cell phone. It's in the 
it's of course it's not like it's on the side it's right in the center of the swimming pool <laughs> so i mean i have to get down on my stomach trying to fish this goddamn cell phone that's on the ground the bottom of the swimming pool out of the swim out of it and in the process i end up basically falling into it and just completely getting drenched and i'm so pissed off because i am drenched from head to toe at this point and somehow i've gotten fiberglass stuck in my hands from using the net i don't know what the fuck's going on with that net but it's a piece of shit trust me so i go in with the cell i I walk into the lobby with the cell phone and i am just i have the type of look that basically says do not fucking talk to me right now while dripping just (laughs) completely and there's a guest just standing at the lobby waiting to check in and she looks at me and she goes i'll wait and she sits down <laughs> so that's the that's the best intro to a guest i've given lately yeah. <laughs> yeah so why did they even want the cell phone if it was submerged underwater i don't know i mean that's ridiculous there's nothing logic. you can get off that phone <laughs> yeah I feel bad because that guy was probably a couple of days after he got out of jail. He probably, one, didn't get his phone back. Two, if he did, he was at some place. He's at Verizon going, can you fix it? And they're like going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, the next day he drove to the old place, Bob, and you had to deal with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I would have said, what, where was it wet at? <laughs> well, I got in a pool. A pool. Okay. As soon as, they, as soon as the customer tells me that their phone got wet, I won't even touch it. Wow. You know, because me, I'm like, you know, I, people will lie, you know. Every once in a while you get somebody who's like, yeah, what's wrong with your phone? I'm sitting there handling their phone and everything. As I dropped into the toilet, I'm like, oh, really? Okay, I'm not handling your phone anymore. <laughs> and I'm going to disinfect my whole body. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a phone number and you can call and file your own claim. <laughs> well, can you fix it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Speaking of cell phones, once I had this cop come in always cops coming in my hotel <laughs> this cop he comes in with this drunk lady she, he had found old like driving drunk and instead of arresting all he just took her to a, a close hotel and so she could sleep it off so she goes up to her room to sleep and after she leaves he looks at me he goes do you know anything about cell phones <laughs> i go what he repeats the question he goes the thing is, I recently switched cell phones, but on my old cell phone, I had all these evidence photos I was supposed to save, and now I can't find them on my cloud. Do you know how to get to a cl- the cloud? I was like, no, I don't. He began just going off, not at me, just at himself. He was like, you stupid piece of shit. Why did you lose all those evidence <laughs> photos? <laughs> I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> so we could have used you, Bob. I deal with out. those kind of people every day. <laughs> but those pictures were so important. Did you have them backed up anywhere other than the phone? No. Well, then they weren't very important. <laughs> it just most people don't like that answer, but because I mean, because yeah. it's so fucking obvious. But I mean, it's just it's the truth. They need to hear it. You know <laughs> how amazing it's some, is that? Like, you know. like this, like <laughs> this cop, right? He has all these evidence photos just on his phone, no place else. Why does he have his job? Exactly. But with phones these days, I mean, they, they're they introducing waterproof ones anyway, aren't they? So within a few years, this swimming pool scenario wouldn't have been a problem. I'm, di- yeah, but, I'm directing mean, that at you, Bob, as the <laughs> cell phone expert. I'm not demanding Max answer that. It's possible, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, very, it's very possible, Michael. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, that's that then, isn't it? Good. Well, I think it's uh, it's time to remind you that last time you were on the podcast, and this is Max, not Bob, we found out after the show that you took a piss on the air. So I wonder what reassurances we have that that won't happen again this time. You don't have any. I'm on my fifth at the moment. So, I mean, it could happen. Any moment. <laughs> like, you, just to clarify, your fifth what, Max? <laughs> My fifth alcoholic beverage. Okay, okay. It's <laughs> important to know. <laughs> I mean, I could, be, I could be doing it right now. Are you? Should I admit that? 
If you are, I think it's it's best that the listeners know. <laughs> Why do you think that? <laughs> <laughs> How did you come to that conclusion? <laughs> but this this uh, incident seems to link well into Isaac masturbating off the top of the hotel roof. Does it? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> I've definitely okay. decided it does. Um, <laughs> okay, it it does link into that. <laughs> was was that an autobiographical moment in the nightly disease? It was not. <laughs> However, after the book was released, <laughs> uh, I, 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 <laughs> stay with me. A pre a previous co local found me on Facebook. He asked me if I had ever done that on his own vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> but he's convinced I used to do that. Oh, God. <laughs> now, <laughs> like if my GM reads this book, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I may be out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be publishing full time. <laughs> it's always a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, we just lost two other night people. So I'm I'm all they got. Yeah, I guess at that point you can masturbate off anything you're indispensable i can just go in the rooms and do it why yeah. not yeah <laughs> no no i can't <laughs> i'm not gonna i need i need to make it obvious i'm, I'm not gonna do that yeah <laughs> I, I had never once said that <laughs> you're gonna have co-workers if they listen to it that are gonna be convinced that you do do it it's not gonna matter how much you reassure them you don't I'm already waiting for the phone call from my mom now. Yeah, yeah. She 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 listened to the last one. She'll listen to this one too. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Well, in that case, then it is a fantastic time to get into our final Patreon question <laughs> from Adrian Shotbolt. Which book has Max's mom read, and how many stars did she give it? I assume he's talking about your own work, not just generally what one book has your mum read. To be honest, she used to read a lot of books, so I mean, it has to be about my own reading, I would assume. But to kind of derail the question, she was basically the one who got me into Stephen King and all those types of books because she just had those paperbacks laying around all over the damn place and I picked them up, so thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> what book has she read by mine? I assume Adrian is talking about my bio I've posted. Yeah, the bio says, I've written five books and my mom has read only one of them. <laughs> I know she read Toxicity. She would have probably rated it three out of five, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if she's read anything else. So it sounds like you don't have many conversations with your mom about your writing. Not too often, although she did help me recently with that novella I recently talked about. I needed someone to beta read some sections, and she was all about that. Although the novella is about a guy who just keeps bleeding from his dick, so maybe I should have sent it to somebody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Max, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Well, that wasn't too long ago. <laughs> what advice? Let's see. Don't trust Jacob. Okay. Would you like to elaborate? <laughs> nah, he'll know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> he will know exactly what I mean by that. Sounds cryptic. <sighs> Yeah, Jacob was not a nice guy. Also, that makes other it advice. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yeah, just to keep doing what you're doing. I mean, maybe think about things more before just going all in. Plan out the small press a bit more before just saying "fuck it" and doing it. That was kind of a spontaneous decision. <laughs> right. Right. So that would be my biggest. A bit of advice after Don't Trust Jacob is to put some more thought into how you want to begin a small press and just don't go into it without researching anything at all. Hmm. So what perhaps are some of the things you would have researched? Just things about budget, how to promote 
books, Wolf of Dam, how to <laughs> get reviews from high, highly read audience audiences. I I'm getting some nice reviews now with the books we published, but it would have been nice to to have been doing that from the get go. I kind of just went straight into it without thinking, and some of the books we published in that in those that first twelve months maybe didn't do as well as they could have been thanks to my sloppiness yeah and just don't trust jacob yeah i guess that's the big take home for anyone <laughs> don't listen to what he says don't get don't get in the trunk when he says to get into the trunk it's not going to be a game <laughs> hmm. all right i don't even know a jacob but i feel like that if i meet him i'm not going to trust him but that's the thing about Jacob, okay? He has the type of face. He talks, He has a lot of charisma. and You want to be his friend immediately. The way he just walks into a room. He owns the joint. And you look at him and think, Wow, goddamn. That guy is someone I want to call my friend. But he's not going to be your friend, okay? Because sooner or later, he's going to say, Hey, Max, why don't you get in this trunk? It'll be fun. And then you'll say, Okay, Jacob. And you'll get into the trunk. And you know what's going to happen? You goddamn know what's going to happen. I'm, I don't even have to tell you. It's going to happen. You're going to wake up. A pumpkin's going to be on top of your head. And you're going to have to get to the town hall before all the kids in town destroy you. It happens every time. Goddamn Jacob. <laughs> they made a movie about that. It's called Season of the Witch. <laughs> wow. It's, a, it's also a book by Norman Paltridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know anybody named Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad you'll stay up, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> this is a little fuel time. So, do you have two fiction and two non fiction recommendations for our listeners? <sighs> yes. Non fiction would be Ghostland by Colin Dickey, which is about random hauntings throughout the U.S. I'm not done with it yet, but I'm about halfway. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. I would also recommend Thrill Me by Benjamin Pilsey, which I have not exactly read, but I've read samples of, and it seems like it's worth my time. I just I need to buy it with magic money. Um, fiction novels, I would recommend... <laughs> trying to think of something. Um, Mongrels by Stephen Graham Jones, but... Who doesn't know about that book already? I would also recommend Mojo Rising by Bob Pastorella. <laughs> Have you That's guys read that choice. book? That's a good choice. Yeah? <laughs> that is a good choice. I thought so. I've seen uh, somebody else had uh, posted something about Ghostland. And it was it. Um, Paul Tremblay. Yeah, yeah. I want to I read that. So you're it's about pretty... halfway through it, so it's pretty good? Yeah, I like it. I... Um, it was given to me as a Christmas gift. I had no idea what it was. And then when Paul Tremblay posted about it, I was like, oh, yeah, it's that book I got. So I opened it up, and yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I got I got a second you on Thrill Me, man. I'm, I'm, I'm reading it and kind of working it in with my other reading and stuff. And, uh, man, it, it's it's good. It, it's I've read a ton of, of how-to books, and this one, this one is pretty much, you know, different. Damn, and I, I get it. You know, it's uh, I don't know, man. It's like he just writes from this pulp culture, but he know he knows his shit, you know, background and yeah. uh, the advice the advice that he's given in these essays is practical stuff, right, you know? right, and that, and it's stuff that I think that that any any writer, whether beginning, middle, end, well, golly, I don't think anyone would be at the end of their career, other than Philip Roth, who's just basically retired. But uh, you know, anyone in their in any point of their career could use any of this stuff. It's just it's practical stuff. I think it's good. So far. Well, we spoke a little bit about it in the last podcast with Gamut magazine, but I would reiterate recommending it. I mean it's great as well if you want to write something that's pitched somewhere between genre and literary, taking the best elements of both and you know, I'd recommend it alongside, of course, Stephen King's 
on writing and Jeff Vandermeer's Wonder Book as some of the best books you can get on writing. I would love to get a layman's book. Have you, do you guys know what I'm talking about, Richard Layman? I know what you're talking about, but I, I found it quite difficult to track down. I have not found it yet. It's just it's gone. I it's one of my books I want so so badly, but it's not going to happen until someone brings it back. Mm. What what was it? I can't think of the title at the moment. But I mean, but basically, it was just him talking about writing. Yeah, it's about his background writing. And I think it's a he offers advice as well. Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding yeah. of it. it. Sounds very interesting, but it's so difficult to get a hold of. Is it just called A Writer's Tale? Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's the one. I'd imagine someone will bring it back. I mean, goodness, there's enough demand for it. Just a question of when. Maybe soon. Well, are there any writers who intimidate you? <sighs> yeah, Josh Malaman. That dude has a new idea every five minutes, and everyone is amazing. Yeah. I mean, you would know you published him. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I'd second that. He's, he's tremendously talented, and, I mean, he's also in a super successful rock band as well. If the guy, H- how if the the guy fuck does he wasn't do it? so likable, if he wasn't such a nice, brilliant, amazing guy, everyone would hate him. But he, he's, yeah. he's a great dude. So much energy, so much enthusiasm. I mean, just talking to him about writing, it's, he's just so goddamn excited mm. about just writing. It's, it's yeah. great. Oh, yeah. He's very good. Absolutely. Well, before we go, are there any things that we haven't discussed that you'd like to cover or to talk about? You know, preferably to do with writing, but we'll see, oh, we'll see what um... you come out with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, man. At least about writing. I mean, I think we should be all set. Fantastic. So what what final thoughts do you have for our listeners? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <Just that>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Max. <laughs> and where can, where can our listeners connect with you if somehow they still want to do that after? Like my fit. Like my physical address? That that would be great because no one's got okay. their address yet on the show. Yeah, okay, so it's in Texas. The town <laughs> is Cibolo. Now there's this gas station in Cibolo. It's called the Cibolo Street Gas Station. Okay, that's the name. It's a shitty name, I know. If you go to that gas station sometime between 3 and 5 p.m. on a weekday, I should be in sometime buying a fountain drink of Diet Coke. And if you need to ask me anything at all, just walk in and say, hey, and then ask me the question. And I will try to provide an answer. And that's where you can connect with me. At the Cibolo Street gas station. On weekdays between 3 and 5 p.m. Okay. If you go there before 3 or after 5, you're going to end up no. talking to Jacob. So exactly. you don't want to do that. Yeah, unless, you don't you do spend, that. unless you want to spend all goddamn night in the trunk. Right. Okay, well, Max, thank you so much for spending time with us on the This Is Horror podcast. For those listening, remember to pick up the nightly disease and to head on over to the Dark Moon Digest and Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing Patreon page and pledge your dollar. All right, thank you very much for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. I hope you found the interview both entertaining and useful. Now, if you enjoyed the humour in that episode, or if you want an insight into some of the tangents that we went off on, then do stick around post-outro, because we've got about seven minutes of outtakes, which I found entertaining, but perhaps didn't quite further the conversation for those looking for writing advice although i'm sure that max booth would disagree with that and in fact in the outtakes i think he does and says that everything in there was of value well you let me know before i wrap up 
A quick word, as always, from our sponsors. You will never forget I Can Taste the Blood, a new collection of dark fiction from Bram Stoker nominees Josh Mallerman, John F.D. Taff, and more. Open the doors to a theater of the damned. Walk 500 miles in the footsteps of sin. Commit a crime spree that never ends. Witness life and death through the eyes of a tortured soul. And learn the truth about what's killing small-town America. I Can Taste the Blood is now available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymetalpress.com. The Tennis Podcast is a docudrama about an ancient and mysterious myth, perhaps the last genuine mystery of the information age. It is a cross between Serial, Lost, and an Andre Tarkovsky film. Tennis is what happens when the lines of science and fiction start to blur. So download the podcast The Guardian Calls, compelling and wildly addictive, at iTunes.com slash Tannis or TannisPodcast.com. Tannis, it's television for your ears. Next week, we will be back with an interview with Simon Kurt Unsworth. If you'd like to support the podcast and keep the show alive, and in doing so, get early bird access to every single episode and the opportunity to ask the guest a question, then head on over to our Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror and pledge one dollar. Or pledge more if you like. I won't complain. Now, as astute listeners will know, There's a number of us taking part in a one story per week challenge. The idea being that 25 of us have decided in 2017 that we're going to write one story a week. At least, in fact, that's the minimum. So we have a support group where we post inspirational quotes, encouragement, progress and I was speaking to George Tooley, who used to be my creative writing professor when I was studying my undergraduate degree at the University of Warwick. And he had some great advice, which I shared with the group. And I think it should also be of value to all of you. So I'd like to share that with you. You have to leave your ego at the door when you're drafting It's an old cliche, but important. You can't keep second-guessing the story or allowing your doubt in the room. Try and wipe away those insecurities about whether something is good or bad will please or displease readers, even before you've written it. It's a constant battle because the ego is always fighting to get back in. You need a part of your personality to enjoy the work to keep yourself motivated, even as you need to separate out the critical part. Let your imagination set the parameters for what you're doing. Don't control it. Jack Spicer used to say that inspiration and poetry came from East Mars. You can't control what's outside of yourself or the subconscious, but you can edit it later. So don't hold back. Don't ask questions now, but do record them. If things occur that you're unsure about, just jot them down somewhere separate to the story. You can revisit them when you start editing. And that is from George Tooley, my creative writing professor at Warwick and author of the poetry collection Static Exile. And you spell Tooley, double T, double O, U, L, I. And with that said, I'll catch you next week when we're back with Simon Kurt Unsworth. Until then, look after yourself take care of one another, read horror, and have a great, great day. Ah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, those aren't words. <laughs> I know, but still. <laughs>
Max has gone. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> Max has died. <laughs> I was just thinking about that infamous scene in it at the end with the um, massive child sex scene. Last time we spoke of you, it must have been about a year and a half ago. Seems that way. Yeah. Well, it was, in fact, because <laughs> I researched before. Um, so that was oh, look how fancy Michael is. I know, I he know. Can look at facts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so that was episode 56 for anyone who wants to listen to that. Uh, Max, what episode is this? You might want to listen to that because you were drunk and don't remember any of it. <laughs> that but, doesn't seem like I should listen to it, no. Uh, but anyway, so... <laughs> 2016 what what did you get up to then what were some of the biggest lessons learned lessons of i had a new book released 2016 i don't know <laughs> <laughs> It is good advice, and I'm sure I had a much better, more in-depth response first time round. <laughs> Do you want me to read it? <laughs> <laughs> what, did, did you fucking read that? You, so this wasn't you regurgitating off the top of your head. You literally <laughs> got the fucking script in front of you. <laughs> okay. I can read it out No, don't, okay. don't read it. We've got... <laughs> Bob, okay. react react to that. Max has given some good advice. You can react authentically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. No uh, words. Authentically. I love that word. For <laughs> <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> no, I mean, it. it, it is, that is good uh, writing advice. Because it, <laughs> it allows you to be... Hold on. I think we need to. Re- <laughs> I gotta get this out. We need to retake <laughs> that, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I was like, retake the whole thing. I, I, I think the problem is that this whole <laughs> podcast <laughs> has to feel that it's all one big in joke. <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like there's something else going on. People are gonna listen to it. Oh, what the fuck, man? There's something they're not talking about. <laughs> this, this is gonna <laughs> gonna take some exceptional editing. <laughs> it's only week two, man. <laughs> That's why we're a couple of weeks in. <laughs> a, couple, a, couple, a couple is two. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's special opinion, but okay. It's not a fucking special <laughs> opinion. Let's go to the dictionary. Let's go. <laughs> uh, well, I, week I, one, I... a fucking dictionary. Couple. Two people or things. There we go. <laughs> ah, damn. Bested by the dictionary again. Okay. <laughs> is this actually a French vanilla creamer, or is this some... Some code it's, not a, it's not a sex thing, yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a kinky pissing fetish. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I don't care Long how I don't, I don't care how fucking unhelpful your answers are. I'm gonna drag something helpful out of you. <laughs> Why? Why would they? Why is it unhelpful? I thought that was extremely <laughs> helpful. Well, it got helpful at the end. <laughs> I see. <laughs> after, after you tell it, told them not to do it, which was clearly not within the spirit well, of the question. Well, <laughs> don't you? Don't you think if they really want to do it, they would listen to all the shit I said, and if they wanted to do it, they would stick around for the helpful advice. That's how you know who's extremely devoted. There you go. Because I'm I'm puzzled by that question. And I I don't know if I should take offense. Maybe I should. I, I think you should definitely take offense, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm, gonna... I'm gonna take all the fences. Yeah. I'm taking them all. Look at what you've done, Thomas. Look at what you've done. But now we have no fences. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what will pillowcase my dogs when they go out to pee? What? What did you just say, Max? 
<laughs> but we'll keep my dogs from running free when they go outside to pee. Yeah. If we have no fence. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. That Tom, is, that's a really good question. Thomas. Maybe some fences should remain. Mm. Things to think about, Thomas. Well, you took them. <laughs> so, I mean, you could have the fences. Well, you, you know, I, I had to take them because of the way Thomas asked that question. So, thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah. Now my dogs are lost. And I have no dogs. I mean, Thomas, I don't want to go on about it too much, but the podcast was going on track. We had a sensible question from David Powell, and now you've gone and completely derailed it again. So, Mm -hmm. thanks, Thomas. I don't even want to continue now. Yeah, maybe, maybe, Thomas, you should just uh, (laughs) stop being a patron and just, you know, there's the door. No, I'm so <laughs> sorry about this, everyone. Thomas, stop fucking listening. Okay. I think he's gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we can continue the show that Thomas is out. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, is, Tom, is Thomas listening right now? Because we kicked him out. Is this a live show? Uh, it might be that Thomas only finds out that he was kicked out in the outtake. So for, for, for now, he's not aware of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Thomas. I'm just trying to move the conversation away from pulling stuff out of our anus. <laughs> that could be a new segment. <laughs> <laughs> What's in my anus? <laughs> Reach in. What can you find? All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> this has been very fucking entertaining, and hopefully, hopefully, the listeners will agree. <laughs> Again, I apologize. <laughs> There's nothing to apologize for. No. Uh, until the until Patreon just goes down. <laughs> yeah, maybe at <laughs> that moment. 